<laughs> okay, this morning I'd like to look at the issue of uh, discipline. You know, discipline is about teaching. Uh, you know, your child, uh, say your teenage uh, child is out and they're supposed to be home at uh, uh, 11 o'clock and they arrive home at seven minutes after 11. And um, the parent is irate uh, and they say that for the rest of your life, uh, you will never be allowed to watch TV. That, that's a punishment. Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. We do this even in our judicial system, but uh, there's no connection between what happened and the ramifications. It, it doesn't uh, fit the category of discipline. Discipline is teaching. It's teaching someone something. And from time to time, we all need to have that kind of experience, regardless of what position we hold in the life of the church whether we are the Patriarch of Antioch, the Metropolitan of America, a parish priest, a deacon, a subdeacon, a lay person, we all, from time to time, need to learn lessons. Uh, it has been said that it is not true that we learn from our mistakes, we learn when we reflect upon our mistakes. And so part of that, that whole disciplinary process is taking seriously what we have done and accepting the uh, consequences of, of that. Uh, we see this uh, in our lessons for today. Our lesson from the book of the prophet Ezekiel is about watchmen calling uh, people out of the community to be uh, watchmen for the community. This, I think, is one of the primary responsibilities of a parish priest and, and of a bishop of the church, is to be a watchman, to look over the horizon and to see the dangers that are coming that could affect the church and uh, turn people away from the faith uh, and to warn them. You know, and I've done this, you know that, uh, from time to time. I have pointed out things to you that I think are uh, of grave danger to being a Christian that are on the horizon of the, the society that we live in. Um, I'm responsible to do that. Uh, bishops are called to be guardians of the faith. If they do not guard the faith, they are failing uh, in their ministry of being watchmen. But also the other side of the whole process is that if you do not want to hear the warning and you do not want to heed it, your blood is not on my hands. I've done my job. You have failed in your responsibility. One of the important lessons that, when I was involved with the Grubb Institute, one of the important lessons we would teach clergy that were coming to the conferences who were in trouble in their parishes would be, you are responsible for the effort not the outcome. I can't be responsible for the outcome. That's your responsibility. But I am responsible for warning you and admonishing you and encouraging you and questioning you. That, that, that is the job of a, of a pastor. The second lesson for today was from uh, Ephesians in which we are, we are called to renew uh, to be renewed in the spirit of our minds, to be able to change, change our perspective. Um, what, we, what we tend to do as human beings is we want to change that which is causing us discomfort. We want to change the other person, what they're doing. We want to change the situation. Sometimes it's important to make a decision and say, say for instance, this job is not for me. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you've had 15 jobs in three months, maybe you should take some time to look at you rather than at jobs. You know, so uh, the renewal of the mind, the way we see things, you know, we talked 
about reframing things. You know, you can, someone's kind of a, is grumpy uh, and you assume that they are mad at you. You know, uh, the other op option would be they're a little grumpy. You could maybe surmise that maybe they've had a rough morning and it has nothing to do with you whatsoever. The third lesson uh, is Jesus sending us out uh, into the harvest, sending us as lambs into the midst of wolves. And uh, things that are decided by, by uh, Christian leaders and things that are decided by Christian communities, uh, this is going to set us at odds with the culture that we live in. There's just no way around it. No way around it. So Canon 102 of the Quintessex Council of 692. I'd like to look at it uh, with you if, you, if you have it in front of you. Those who have received from God authority to bind and to loose must take into consideration the quality of the sin. You know, one of the really important things in, as a parent is to decide what really is important. The fact that they're two minutes late may not be that big a deal. You know, the fact that they stole your car might be pretty significant. So we have to determine with the quality of the sin. Not all sins are equal, let's face it. You know? uh, the other thing that has to be determined in pastoral care is the willingness and the readiness of the sinner to return. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So a, a, a priest, a confessor, say for instance in, in the sacrament of uh, penance or in a counseling situation, you have to determine, number one, the seriousness of the situation and secondly, the willingness of the person to change. And we've all had situations when we could look at ourselves and say, you know, the problem was me. I was unwilling to look at myself. and thus to offer treatment suited to the sin in question. There's a book that was written by Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. It was criticized at the time that it came out because that he was seen to be too lenient. You know, it'd be things like uh, you uh, committed a sin, say for instance, came late to church, uh, the punishment might be 40 days without communion. You know, people say, ooh, that's really too lenient. It should be more severe, you know. So you have to determine what's the best treatment for, a, for something that we have done wrong. Um, and the reason why this is, the canon says, is that by employing an immoderate adjustment in one direction or the other, they fail in encompassing the salvation of the one who is ailing. So one of the things is that we might be too harsh, might be too harsh of a punishment, you know, never watch TV again for the rest of your life because you're one minute late coming on, a little too harsh. Or it may be too lax, you know, they stole the car. The, the, uh, the discipline that's, in, that's uh, instituted is that you can't have a cookie for five nights before you go to bed with a glass of milk. You know? no, no relationship between the seriousness of the, of the problem and the, uh, and the uh, less seriousness. For the diseases called sin, our church realizes that sin is a disease. It's not about the court. It's not about a court and, a, and lawyers and judges and punishments, and that, that's not, that's not what, what sin is about. Sin is a disease. It's a disease of the soul. And they are not simple affairs. But on the contrary, they are various and they are complex. We surely don't know why 
people do what they do. You know, we're not, we're not even sure that we know what, why we behave the way we behave. You know? Because sin and the way that it entraps a person and the way it, it, it uh, uh, imprisons them is it's a very complex process. And they produce many offshoots of injury. You know, we might think that something is a very unimportant thing, but yet it has far reaching ramifications to other people down the road. So it's important to take seriously uh, our behavior. As a result whereof, the evil becomes widely diffused and it progresses until it is checked by the power of one treating it. So one of the problems is that when we are doing something that separates us from God, that it begins to grow. It begins to have a life of its own. It begins to be consuming and destructive and ultimately leads to, to death. So that a person who is professing the science of treating ailments as a spiritual physician ought first to examine the disposition of the sinner and to ascertain whether he tends toward health or on the contrary provokes the malady to attack him by his own actions. At the same time bearing in mind that he must provide against any reversion considering whether the patient is struggling against the physician and whether the ulcer of the soul is being aggravated by the application of the remedy and accordingly to meet out mercy in due proportion to the merits of the case. So one of the things that it tells us is that the responsibility of a pastor and a, and a confessor it's very, very serious and very, uh, uh, very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to ascertain the, per the person's sense of responsibility and what will lead them toward repentance and what will push them toward further separation from God. For all that matters to God and to the person undertaking pastoral leadership consists in the recovery of the straying sheep and in healing the one wounded by the serpent. That's, that's what's so important. So when discipline, when discipline is uh, applied to a person, to a child, uh, to someone that works for us, to, uh, to a penitent Christian, it has to be done for uh, two purposes, to recover them and to heal them. So it's not punishment. It's a process of learning in order to enable the person to return to the church and to experience health. Accordingly, he ought not to drive the penitent to the verge of despair, nor give him rein to dissoluteness and the contempt of life, but on the contrary, in at least one way at any rate, either by resorting to extremer or stringent remedies, or to gentler and milder ones, to curb the disease. and to put up a fight to heal the ulcer for the one tasting the fruits of repentance and wisely helping him on the way to the splendid rehabilitation to which a man is being invited. So when you're meeting out discipline in any situation, the ultimate goal is that splendid rehabilitation. Not to push them away, but to bring them toward repentance. We must therefore be versed in both, both the requirements of being accurate, not just glossing over things and saying no big deal, 
you know, because we don't want to hurt their feelings, hurt the, the other person's feelings. Oh, don't worry, it's just fine, you know. We all steal things from time to time, or whatever, you know. No, to, 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 be, to, be, to be honest and accurate, and also the requirements of custom. The, the way in which a, a community governs itself, uh, rather than imposing, uh, it, it would never be, it would never be appropriate for me, for instance, to use a person's mistake as an example to the whole group by pointing it out or making them an example. That is just not an appropriate way of disciplining a person who has fallen into sin. In the case of those who are obstinately opposed to the extremities, that is, being too lax or being too harsh, we must follow the formula handed down to us by Basil the Great. And it's a big book about that thick that you could read about how to administer discipline to those who have sinned. I hope you'll read this, and, and I hope that you will, uh, as it says in one of our prayers, read, mark, and inwardly digest this canon, because it is a wonderful uh, picture for us of how we should be governing ourselves. You know? Not being too harsh on ourselves, but also not being too lax. Not using the excuse, well, I'm only human, you know, or the devil made me do it or whatever, you know. But being honest, being honest with ourselves and recognizing the impact of our behavior on ourselves, on the members of our family, and on the members of our community. To take up this role ourselves, uh, to, to, to pastor ourselves, I, I think this is something that uh, many people uh, fail at. Learning how to pastor yourself, to care for your spiritual life and to make this a priority. I hope that reflecting on, I, I think, one of the, the most profound canons uh, of all the zillions of ecclesiastical canons that there, are, there might be, this gives us a picture of how not only those who are called to be confessors can help people move toward the restoration of health, but also how we as individuals can work on our own spiritual life. Because at the end, you know, the church is a hospital and we all are in need of medicine. And we have come here today to once more receive the medicine of immortality, the life-giving mysteries of Christ. May God give us the insight to, to understand our own failures <coughs> and to forgive the failures of others. Amen. Amen.